Oh, hello there. Hello, hello. Good Friday. Good morrow. Good sir. Hello, ma'am. Kia ora. Um, uh, yeah, good, good man. In, uh, well, end of a, a normal, you know, people who work jobs that are Monday to Friday, nine to five, like adult jobs. Not me, obviously. Um, not but, me. Either. But you know, enjoy your long weekend. Whatever. I'll be there. Uh, yeah. Good. good. Sorry. Yeah. I, just no day off. And that's you. No Monday off for me. No, short, mm. shorter hours, but uh, still definitely working uh, because of my deep respect for the Queen. Because of the public holiday out of the blue there, even mm. though it's kind of a one-off, is it still time and a half day in lieu for people who are working? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, cool. um, you're completely standard. So, yeah, like we're running Sunday hours as an example, and um, I imagine I get time and a half. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank and you, and lieu. Queen. Thank you, Queenie. Yes. yes. Yeah, uh, it's my normal rostered day. So, yeah, I'd get a day in yeah. lieu as well. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's always good. I, I used to, when I was working in various jobs, I used to always try and work um, work in publics. Uh, mm-hmm. when, when when working in radio, which, I mean, I know I talk about that a lot, but f- from my employed career since the mid-90s, that's basically all, all I've done <laughs> as, an empl- and as an employed person. I've done other things for myself, but working for someone else, radio is all I've done since 97. Mm-hmm. So that's my terms of reference. But I would always offer to, or not always, but most of the time offer to work uh, the public holidays for a couple of reasons. One is time and a half day in lieu. And the second thing was always you can bank up those, oh, the, sorry, and the second, so you can bank up those holidays and then you have like 10 extra holidays over the Christmas period, 10 extra days off. Although I'd work the Christmas periods and then like have a month mm-hmm. off in March. Yeah. Um, but the other thing was uh, no one's around. There's something about working like in a, in a in an office space, which is basically all a radio station. When there's no one around, it's just I know very what you different. Mean. It's very I know different. What you mean. That, that's no pants in the office, Pat. I, yep, I like, understand. Like right now, like right now. Yep. But I do it right now because I'm at home. I I talking of holidays like this. Uh, I worked this out the other day because um, I've worked mass market retail for so long. This coming Christmas is the first time that I went to my boss and said, hey, man, I don't want to work Boxing Day and I want to leave and go away for like two weeks. Yeah, now, nice. here's my case. No, hear me out. Just let me explain. <laughs> and he just stared at me and goes, yeah, man, that's that's fine. Were you expecting a fight? And I'm like, oh, it's not a problem. He goes, yeah, man, Boxing Day is not a big big thing for us. So all, all good. Have a good trip. I do because like, I get. But I was I guess, ready for a fight. I want. I mean, can fight. we can we say where you used to work? Is that all right? Because that's not where you work now. Uh, you ha- you have well, showed your certificate. You have your oh, public, that, that is a good point. Yeah. You've broadcast. No, I, I, uh, I used to work for JB Hi-Fi, but that's um, the place where everyone goes on Boxing Day. Yeah, like yeah, the TV yeah. that I've got upstairs in my lounge, I think it's from JB Hi-Fi on Boxing Day, down from four and a half thousand to eighteen hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that's kind of set up for pe- having a busy box in places like that. The worst shopping experience you can <laughs> ever have. I can almost guarantee that that TV was probably cheaper a couple of weeks before at the start of December. I, but I, won't I was giving you that it. again. I was <laughs> it. You know, there there are legitimate deals there. Yep. Um, but the vast majority of deals are in December, and then you'll have like I used to say to people, I can tell you right now what Boxing Day will be. There'll be a laptop that's really cheap. There'll yep. be a TV that's really cheap. Do you mean singular? Be, yeah, probably. Like, 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 like they will pick like one TV that we can get enough of that is not on sale during the rest of December. And right. then for the th- for the days of for Boxing Day to New Year's, we'll do it on a deep discount. We'll move 400 units of it. And that that's it. That You can't have deals on everything because it gets too messy. You can't get enough stock. So you just pick your Boxing Day specials and then you have like 20% off DVDs and 20% off whatever and and you know that people are going to come in and they're going oh this is horrible well we came down here we better buy something yeah right and and it's just like the people that come in and ask for like you know they're expecting the full customer service experience from people from staff that just look like they're experiencing the vietnam war again (laughs) yeah you know it's just what do you want um did you yeah i'm glad i'm not i'm not going into that again this year did you ever see uh, the South Park episode about Black Friday? They did like a thing a series oh, of two or three. Oh yes! Them. And Randy was working in as a, as a security a... guard, and all and about all the stories about how they'd 
they lose people every year from security guard. And the guy had the scar over his eye and he peeled it off and gave it to Randy because that was like his captain's badge. And yeah, it's very, very funny. Yeah, where I work now, Black Friday, not a thing. Boxing Day, not a thing. Well, to be honest, I Black, Black Friday, it. not be honest, Black Friday, not a thing in New Zealand. Some retailers oh, no. are trying to make it a thing, but increasingly but actually, it is. Yeah. Um, and it's brought out a special class of munter. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> glad that I had to put up with that anymore. Um, I I mean, I think there's a story that I want to play a little bit of. It's it's more it's a human interest story. It's not big news, but it kind of leads on into a couple of things. It came out a, a few days ago, actually. I'm not sure when this Tame E.T. story came out. Um, but if people haven't seen it, I'm going to play something for you. And I'm, I've got the audio off on purpose. And the reason I've got the audio off on purpose is it uh, features Snoop D.O. Double Jizzle, and it'll get us thrown off uh, the internet immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not going to play it. But uh, Tama, Tami, because he, he explains how to say his name. Me, ta, me, ta, me, yeah. I, I, um, I've realized from this that I've been saying his name wrong for years so he's just spent three minutes or two minutes talking about how to say his name with some um, kiwi music in the background and then he's in a and he's in an art gallery and i know most of you have probably heard about this but i hadn't seen it and what mm. he does is he goes to someone else's piece of work and he uh <laughs> he paints out his own name on someone else's piece of work here we go this is him painting it out so he paints out the tama because it's tame and uh, he writes his own name on. I mean, the balls of the man. He's in an art gallery right now. This is not someone's home. He's oh just no, it's a, it's a, it's a hotel. It's, oh, it's hotel not a gallery. It? Yeah, that that's um, uh, I forget what they call it, but um, that hotel is full of amazing art. Okay, pieces. sorry. And then he walks out the door, and as he's going, and he goes, he goes, cheers to the person behind the counter. He goes, cheers. it's like very casual. There you go, hey, cheers, cheers. Right and um and there's a bit of a follow up from that. I understand that the artist who basically got his name right, correct me if I'm wrong, because this is what you said is like sweet as, mm. but the person who owns the piece of art is like, what the fuck? Is that yeah. pretty much true? Yeah. So the the artist is a guy called Proudfoot, and um when he was approached for the story, he was like, yeah, it's art is a living thing, and you know if I got his name wrong, then I apologize and I I thank him for correcting it. Um, the the owner of the art piece, however, has considered it like graffiti um, and is uh, apparently pressing charges through the police. So the owner of the artwork doesn't understand art because what no. Tama Eti has just done has probably increased the value, which will be why the person's bought it as an investment, by 10, 20, 30, 100 fold because that piece of artwork in New Zealand now is interesting. You know the Mona Lisa? wasn't that uh wasn't that it wasn't particularly rated very highly until it got stolen and lost and refound it was the story behind it mm. that actually turned it into a valuable interesting piece of art it wasn't considered that before it went missing this has now become a valuable interesting piece of art the value of that painting will be exponentially higher and as and I, I can't say this is proof of that but kind of Speaking to that concept, we all remember the story about um, Banksy. Actually, I'll turn the sound down for this as well. We don't need the sound. And when Banksy's, uh, it was a girl with um, with bubbly heart thing, whatever it's called. Um, and, and Banksy had built into the frame a shredder in case anyone ever sold the painting. And of course, the painting sold for $1.5 million. As soon as the hammer comes down, clunk, there it goes. The thing starts shredding. $1.5 million. The shredder is in the frame. After that, it took years for them for him to release it. But after that, he released videos of him building the shredder into the frame. Oh, there you go. There's some there's some footage. So this is Banksy actually doing it, building it into the frame. Now the 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 shredder. I'm going to pause it there. The shredder actually got, got stuck, and so that's how it ended up. If you're watching with us right now, um, that sold that sold for 1.5 million dollars. I think it was at Christie's. That sold recently. That piece of art because now it's become a much more interesting valuable piece of art with a story behind it for ready for this people if you don't know 25 million dollars so that a very expensive painting story. yeah because it's got a story that very expensive painting that was worth 1.5 million dollars that sold for that uh sold recently this is quite recently so within certainly within five years for 25 million dollars because now it has a story that goes with it so tama iti who has done that to that painting will have just added a huge amount of value to it and an interesting story to it, which will make it something uh, 
that art collectors want to own and art, uh, what's the word for enjoyers? Enthusiasts want to see. I, I, I just go with art enjoyers. Like art enjoyers. That. Art enjoyers want to see. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's really interesting to see what happens. But check that out, man. I mean, you know, from 1.5 million to 25 million because the artist who made the piece of art tried to destroy it and that made it 23 and a half million dollars more valuable to the next person to buy it now just as a a, a we aside with tamaiti as well um claire and i watched uh, an amazing uh, i guess documentary that's on uh, amazon at the moment called the uh, price of peace yeah. which was covering the Irawera raids and trials around it that he, he was um I had some perception of what went on with those Irrawera raids and, and understood it to be a massive police overreach and that sort of thing. But yeah. I, I, if anybody's interested in that sort of thing, definitely go and watch that documentary. Um, I learned a lot uh, through that. It's really, really good. Um, and Tama Iti just can't stop being awesome. So <laughs> go, go him. <laughs> We should get him on one night. I've got a few connections to him. I don't know. I've never met him or spoken to him or anything, but I know several people that know him very well. We should try and either get him on this or get, I'll get him on Doc and do a, mm. a full podcast with him. Hey, um, let's jump into the night, shall we? Uh, look, there's also lots of people. I think uh, Jonty was talking. I'm pretty sure um, this is Jonty talking about uh, Tama just changing mm -hmm. him. This is so good. Good on him. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, Rose says uh, I actually get – I get him back into actually sign the artwork. Well, he doesn't need to. This is the thing about about sort of the art world. He has signed it. It's now got his writing on it where he changed the name. That's actually much more valuable than a signature to it. I I would I would suggest. Hmm. Um, but yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, last night we talked about the uh, I was going to say the case against Nanai Mahuta. It's the wrong way to say it. The investigation that's been announced into Nanai Mahuta. And uh, we put forward, or I put forward, the idea that um, it's not going to be a good look for Labour. I still actually stand by that, that even mm -hmm. if it's a good outcome, like even if everything is cleared and all that sort of thing, there's going to be, you know, you throw enough mud, some will stick. You know, even if Uffendale had been uh, proven beyond shadow of a doubt, and we all accepted that it was okay, there's still a bit of a, uh, you know, greasiness to the whole oh, yeah, thing. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And, and I'm, not, I'm not, not comparing the two situations of what each person uh, allegedly has done and has done, but I'm saying within politics that you know the, the the perception is reality for voters especially, and I and I stand by that idea. One of the things that we didn't investigate too much, true, and I kind of wanted to come back to it, to give you a chance in case you wanted to continue on with it, was the racial undertones. Because yesterday the position I took was not that there's not racial undertones, but the first thing to find out is there if there's any impropriety. That that's the first thing for for me. And then if there's not, that lends itself to even more than why were the accusations made, are there racial undertones? Now, there could be racial undertones. I'm, I'm saying could because I'm being generous to the overall picture. And there still be impropriety. Those two things can live together in yep. this. And I've, uh, I, you know, not that I'm like bowing to Twitter or anything, but I've seen a few comments on Twitter today when I put the clip out there, people saying that the most important thing was the racist and misogynist response in Nanai Mahuta. And I just thought, well... I didn't. We didn't squash that conversation yesterday, but that is the one part of the conversation that we didn't really um, explore too much. And it was a part you wanted to talk about, and I wanted to actually give yeah. you the respect to be able to actually speak to that. And then I also want to read uh, we'll read a part of an article by Martin Bomber Bradbury on Watia and what he had to say about it, because he kind of covers off both aspects as well. Yeah, over to you, sir. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think. <sighs> when you're talking about chucking out mud and seeing what sticks and that sort of thing, one of the things that is always going to stick with a certain segment of New Zealand is um, bloody Maoris. Um, just, you know, you know, you, what's a term you see a lot at the moment? Maori elites. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that uh, Nana Mahuta um, fits in that classification for, for a lot of people. She is an obvious target. Um, she is clearly Māori. She is someone that they hold up and go, see, a high-level Māori, and now she's involved in this. See, we were always right. Mm. And it so she does, does so she doesn't not get the, matter. She doesn't get the grace. Gets, no. Yeah, there's that, There's no grace. There's, there's um, because she's Māori, 
because person X is Māori, if it's a different thing, and because this thing may have happened, then they're guilty, I was going to say by association due to the race, but you know, they're guilty because they're Māori, as opposed to being guilty and being Māori, or, or innocent, guilty or innocent. Yeah, and, and this, this awesome, like, Māori often exist in this amazing place where they're the dregs of society, the bottom feeders, and also this powerful carball of 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 people behind the scenes and they're getting way more than they deserve and that sort of thing and i think that comes back to a whole bunch of stuff you know there, there are studies that have been shown that if you very slightly redress the balance um and let's be clear you know this, this is a charged term but we live in a white supremacist society it's built to european standards for european power and control and that sort of thing and, and honestly there are people who are trying to make redress and maybe going hey look is there a difference between the treaty and the treaty that sort of thing um and, and and when you have people that have been on top for so long and who have never had to th think about how they move through society and every you know one vote one person, um you know oh we're all equal under I know, the I know, law. I know you've all been watching today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we might get to we'll that. Get, we'll get to um, that. We'll get to you that. know we're all equal under the law, right? So there's there, there's no racism here. We're all cool. Um, when that that balance sort of gets ruffled a little bit and and people sort of go well maybe we maybe we haven't been playing a straight bat for 130 odd years um that redress feels like oppression and i i forget the exact numbers but i read a, a study that said that the 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 percentage of change in society to provoke a massive reaction um and a, and, a, and a slight redress of power can be as small as a 5% movement in total control. And, you know, there's, <laughs> there's some of that happening now, and people just focus on it. They really, really zero in. So if they can find a piece of evidence that they go, see, we were always right. They were always, they had their thumb on the scale the whole time, and they yep. can't be trusted, and see, I was right. Yeah, and, and that that's kind of, you know, I'm I'm real concerned about that at the moment because yep. she is a really solid minister with some very very influential um, things, and it and, and it sounds if you take her at her word, it sounds like she she was very aware and did everything right as per the laws and bylaws that she had. Yeah, if she's um, welcoming it and she stuck her hand up and gone, yeah, look, cool, clear me, go for it. Yeah. Uh, just as, speaking of all of this, uh, you can see in, on the screen right now, and if you're watching us on YouTube in particular, that's already in the chat. Friday nights, we often open up the Discord. If you want to mm -hmm. share your views on any of this kind of stuff, jump into Discord, head across to the waiting room. And when we get a chance to bring you on board, we'll bring you on board. I say this every single time. I'll probably balls it up, but we'll give it a crack. <laughs> um, also, Politikiwi says this. Uh, I think the case of racial undertones is further strengthened by the comparison to the lack of scrutiny on key and English era politicians and potential nepotism while they were being in office. Yeah, and I and I think this is probably a good time to head to uh, watianews.com and a piece that was written for what's Bomber's uh, site called? The Daily Blog. Dot nz uh, but uh, martin bomber bradbury who uh, is a uh chewy is a fanboy of would it be fair to say certainly was um depends who I used on which way the wind's blowing mate who i used to know back in the day used to do a show on channel z that we talked about last night uh sunday night talkback show where a lot of people probably of your ilk chewy because you're probably a bit younger than uh, bomber and a bit younger than me um were probably students when he was doing it on sunday nights and it was huge it was so big that uh, it was telecom at the time i, I can because i worked at more of him when bomber worked at channel z i worked mm -hmm. upstairs and he worked on one floor down and i, I would start because i was a it was my first radio job i was doing mid dawns so i would come to work at midnight on sunday night for a sunday night monday morning shift and bomber's show would be going up until midnight and so quite often i'd walk into the studio and hang out with him for an hour while he was doing it um, his, and, his Sunday night show was what made me want to get into broadcasting. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> he, and and there, were, there were times where his talkback show, primarily speaking to, I guess, what are now uh, Gen Xs, when they mm. were kind of probably early teens through mid-20s, um, literally would break the telecom phone lines. <laughs> like would overload the system for telecom. There was so, so many people uh, wanting to get involved with it. And he used to do a thing like, which is like, you know, radio stations do these little kitchen cute things like call number three. He'd do like call number 89 
Yeah. And he'd just go through the phones and go through the phones and he'd stop about every seven person and talk to them and then just keep going. And the phones was crazy. crazy. So it had a massive reach for a period of time to a certain sector of New Zealand. And mm-hmm. people like Joey and myself and, you know, enjoyed it and saw it. And it was a, it was a big part I guess, of both of our backgrounds. So anyway, uh, Bomber is a, a, a pretty radical uh, left wing commentator. Now you see him around the place. Um, and he has written a piece called the case for and against the Naima Mahusa. It's from his site, which is the daily blog.nz, but it's been reposted posted here on uh, watianews.com. I'll read you pretty much all of it, actually. It's not long, um, but I'll, I'll read it out to you. Uh, he says this, I want to start out by confessing I'm a Nanaya Mahuta fanboy, the case for and against Nanaya Mahuta. I want to start out by confessing that. Da, 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 da. Uh, I think she is a remarkable person with enormous intelligence and personal mana. I think she has redesigned foreign affairs uh, in a uniquely powerful and authentic yes. New Zealand diplomatic manner that has indigenous values at its cornerstone. 100% agree. I think her leadership on Three Waters uh, been for the best interest of New Zealand water as a whole. And while I personally want to see far more certainty around eliminating water privatisation, culling cow populations to lower nitrogen levels, polluting our waterways and ending foreign water bottling companies, I do appreciate where Nanaya is taking uh, the country on water. I also think she's been the victim of some of the most appalling and egregious racism I have ever had the disgust of seeing. I think it's important to let people know that privately, beyond the very serious face she now wears as a foreign minister, that Anaya is wickedly funny and has a wonderful, a wondrously dry sense of humor. I have been fortunate enough to have met with Nanaya at various events, and she is one of my favorite MPs. Good setup. He's in love. Perfectly cool. <laughs> so let's get straight into the swirling allegations and speculation regarding her family being appointed as consultants to highly sensitive issues that strike at the heart of our concepts of transparent spending of taxpayers' money. There is no question that valid criticism and rigorous scrutiny will be applied to each of the three cons- consultancies, which is exactly what is happening alongside an investigation by the Public Service Commissioner all of which Minister Mahuta herself has called for, so the swirling allegations and bad faith speculation can be stamped out once and for all. I would like to ask a question to that, and I don't know the answer to this. Did she call for it before Simeon Brown made noises, or did Simeon Brown make noises first and then she called for it? Because that actually makes a difference depending on how much credit mm. one gives to Nanaya for coming sure, out and saying, I want that, actually. Yeah, I'm not either. So so this is not casting uh, casting doubt. It's going to actually, um, actually, let's, we need more information there to find out whether this is kind of altruistic from the Naya Mahuta and she's been like, completely, let's look at this, or whether it's that people have started talking about and then she's done it. And I don't know which way it is, but that would be, to be completely fair and accurate, that would be need to be known. The minister has called this scrutiny upon herself, again, back to the previous point, because she has done exactly what was required in cabinet manual by rescuing herself and stating the conflict of interest, which I think we we said that last night, we talked about that. She has nothing to hide, and it's not her fault that she has a talented family who are experts in this field. Now, this is, I think, a little bit where uh, Bomber starts to, you know, uh, uh, the ideology versus intelligent debate thing. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't know the answers to this yet, but Bomber's already on board in there you know that that, that they, these people are amazing and they're the experts which we i hope that's all right and i'm not saying it's not but that's what we'll find out this all matters because a fundamental part of new zealand political uh value is egalitarianism we need to champion uh mediocrity if you are the best then you get the contract what is at stake here uh, in these investigations of consultancy is not the crime of nepotism it's the failure of uh, of mediocrity. If the minister's whānau are the best to consult on the issue at hand and her interest is noted and she rem- is removed from any decision making, then mediocrity demands her whānau get the consultancy. Now, I would agree with all of that. Remember, I made the example last mm-hmm. night that there's three Barretts in the All Blacks. No nepotism there. There just happens to be three freakishly good rugby players in our top 15 players or top 22 players it does happen without question but again all i'll say is we don't know this yet you know i'm hoping and assuming and uh, uh, it's it's correct but we don't know this yet and that's i think what the investigation is going to show the the true issue at hand is one of perception agree with that which is what we talked about last night it's not enough to be impartial you must be seen to be impartial and the intense focus of the media on this issue requires a full scale scrutiny that the minister herself has called for 
this is the courage of Nanai, and I believe that the reviews will vindicate her. Well, I wouldn't, I'm not saying they won't, but I wouldn't make the, the, the assertion that they will. Um, but there, there's what Bomber had to say, Chewy. What are your thoughts? Um, it always worries me when I read an article from Bomber because uh, he is a left winger that does promote a lot of right wing talking points at times. But I feel like he was reading my brain. After last night's show, I did a little bit of reading and tried to mm -hmm. gather enough information to really form my thoughts because I, I kind of let the story wash over me. Um, and he is echoing a lot of what I thought there. As far as the timeline, just from the quick google oh, yeah, cool. i did over find? here um simeon brown first started talking about this uh in early july yep um nanaya mahuta was doing uh interviews around that time saying that it was um part of the toxicity and that she was on the receiving ends of a lot of me racist memes and stuff like that garrett tremaine cartoons all of the yeah, usual yeah boomer stuff but Disgusting she wasn't thing. going as far as saying yep cool i welcome i welcome the scrutiny at, at that point so i think simeon came in from that where where he's he's been prompted to do that from aspects of of other things i don't know but yeah, it, it, it certainly seems like she tried to play it off as, as like, yeah, haters going to hate. And then as it picked up pace, she's gone, okay, sure, bring it on. I welcome it. Because the flip side to the thing you've just said, yeah, like not just mm -hmm. then, but previously when you're kind of saying, uh, you're almost basically saying people, and I use the word don't have grace for, but when, when people think that the situation and I, look, I was just thinking we should have got Tom Braw on from Waikato University. We're the wrong gingers to be talking about this, but we're talking about it, so we will continue to do so. Um, we, that, that, that you say that, that they're guilty of the alleged offence because they're Māori, not they're guilty of the alleged offence and happen to be Māori. So people don't have the grace for that. But I also want to know where the – where because the flip side of that, like if you're going to the extremes and we're not, but if you're going to the extremes, the other, the other end of that extreme – is um what am i trying to say what i'm trying to say is when 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 is it correct or when can you then or when is it done like like when when can uh when can that argument be used as a defense oh no no you're just being racist now and then mm. maybe it wasn't about that and there was an issue there and i'm not saying that's the case here but i'm like yeah yeah and, and how do you know which one is based on you know telegram um, whatever that other one's called that yeah. with B. And when when those when that's driving it, and how do you know when it's been driven by actually, you know, in this case, and we don't know the facts here, but three family members, you know, thumb on the scale, um, you know, uh, imbalance of power causing these contracts to be awarded when they shouldn't have. Nothing to do with race, just a bad situation. And how do you know and how and, and I and I'm hoping that through the investigation, that's what you find out. Which is why last night I was like, the most important thing to me right now is the investigation, and that will then reveal those things, one would hope. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, it, it, this probably more speaks to the dark and dirty parts of the internet that I tend to dwell on. But I mean, some what, some of this, this the stuff that's been directed at Nanaya Mahuta over the years has been really vile, um, and it only seems to get worse. You know, she's always uh, get, like, especially when she took that. Um, what is it? She's she's foreign affairs, isn't she? Yep, yep, yeah. Um, people's reaction to seeing yeah. a Maori face on the international stage representing our whole country. Holy shit! People got frothy about that. People were talking about having a cannibal cave woman up there, and uh, you know her, her personal looks, and she should have fucking bone through her nose, and all of this horrible, horrible shit. And it just seems like like we've talked about so often with with how i guess stuff has been amplified online over the last couple of years it was a massive ramp up um and yeah if 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 that is <laughs> that illegitimate criticism is latching on to something with just a shred of legitimacy just ev even before like it's important enough to have a look at. We're not sure yet. That is all that these people need to run with. Yeah. 
and they'll just keep that bubbling away in the little hatey hate filled meme factories for fucking ages mm. um it, it, it infuriates me because my, my reaction to seeing a maori face on the international stage representing new zealand was yeah. fuck yes that was cool <laughs> Totally cool. It was cool. And, and then that goes along with the fact that, as by all accounts, she is a staggeringly effective minister in whatever she is involved in. Like, I, I see a, a, a lot of comments about her time as being uh, involved with youth, uh, youth affairs minister or something like that. Um, she was incredibly impactful for that from what I was reading about. So, you know. But, yeah. Let, let the investigation happen. I, I am reasonably confident that they're going to find nothing and then they're sort of going to go, eh, maybe it's something we need to keep our eye on going forward. Uh, we, we had the conversation last night, didn't we? It's like, yeah, yeah. you just shouldn't be good. If, if, if a minister can get a financial advantage from a government contract to their partner, their partner shouldn't be awarded that contract. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong that's happened now. It's in the, it's in the uh, books. It's, it is what it is. But, mm. you know, if, 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 if a minister X is married to partner to, you know, company director Y, and Minister X, you know, has the same joint bank account as Company Director Y, and a government contract goes to Company Director Y and financially advantages him or her, which therefore financially advantages the minister. That's too murky. That should never happen. Mm -hmm. That should ne that should be changed and should never happen again. And that's got nothing to do with Nanaimo Huta, uh, because you know, as people are saying, there was situations in the past, Judith Collins with her husband, and you know, those sorts of things yeah. as well. So it's not. And look, uh, one of the things that. Um, there, there may be hypocrisy here in double standards, as Stephen is saying, if you want to bring that one up as well. Um, but then again, I still want to go and have a look through what has happened, because I do remember Judith Collins being hauled over the coals for conflicts of interest and stuff as well. And she 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 did. And, and that was obvious. And it was part of her downfall. So it has happened to National Party members. It has happened to uh, uh, non Māori as well. So it doesn't mean that this is not based in race and not based in misogyny. Uh, well, mind you, you could say Judith Collins might have been based in misogyny as well, but that wouldn't have been based in race. So that's what I'm saying. It's the I, I hope the investigation gives us more clarity on where this has come from and why. And if there has been impropriety, then then it's come from places. I mean, then they should be called out. They should yeah. be. So, um, Paul, here's got an interesting comment. Strange how things got frothy with a Mary. F uh, sorry, oh, God, I said it in the South Island way. I apologise. Māori, um, Foreign Affairs Minister, following on from Winston Peters. And that is very true. I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, what, what is the what... difference? <laughs> what is uh, the difference? They're well, there's two Maori. things. One's female with a, with a face tattoo. That's the difference. Correct. Yep. One is, you know, visibly Māori. And <laughs> Winston is, he he's, he's cosplaying Winston Churchill, as he always right. has been. Right. So I, I mean that's that's the difference. And he, he has always been stridently against any sort of ad advantage being shown to Maori, even though he is one. Uh, baubles of office. I won't be taking the baubles of office. We oh, all remember that. Yeah. We come back to <laughs> personal integrity there, don't we? Um I was just reading Politi what Politiki we see there. I just thought it's kind of like uh, is it, is it <laughs> yes. Is it Slender Man? What do you say? Or oh, Candy Man? Winston Peters is like Candy Man. We've said his name three times now. We can't say it again, or he will appear in the chat room. So let's just let's just not say it again. I mean, the man Winston is made Peters. out of fine tobacco and brandy. Winston Peters. He smells like a leather bound book. I'm sure. Winston Peters. Oh, look behind you. <laughs> um, right, we're going to move on because that was yes. our introduction. Thirty-four minutes into it, it wasn't really yep. our introduction, but it was our it was our first short story uh, that we were just going to touch on from last night's conversation. And right now, uh, it's one of those situations where we did this so you don't have to. Geez, this is worth a few super chats that we did this so you don't have to. Just between you and me, um, I got real angry. I'm, I'm just going to say because it's a perfect storm of shit that pisses me off. <laughs> You done already? This can I can I actually start before you start ranting? Is that am I allowed to? Shitty parfait onion man. Um, so Christopher Luxon on the platform, uh, I, I want to apologize in advance because I don't know why they don't use uh video connections as much, but um oh, I, we, I we've, we've got a we've got a solution got that a you system. don't have to look at Sean Plunkett the whole time, but we've got a solution which we're gonna do. So, right, uh Christopher Luxon on the platform. Um I wanted to know how it was going to go, I wanted to know what was going to be said, what was going to be asked. Uh so let's just get into a few of the clips that we have set up for you. The first one uh, is Sean Plunkett is asking uh Christopher Luxon about 
you know how we've kind of said um, the the def- the National Party at the moment aren't actually selling anything. They're just saying Labor's bad. They're not saying we're good. They're just saying Labor's bad. It's a kind of a question along those lines, basically saying, is all you need to do hide Mr. Luxon up until the next election and and Labor will implode and you'll win? That's that's the, the summary of the question. And let's have a look what was said. Of both. I mean, the first thing I'd say is that you've got to understand this government is in real trouble because people are over them and they're over them because they're all spin, no delivery. They literally cannot get anything done whatsoever. They're addicted to huge amounts of wasteful spending. That's now leading to, you know, erroneous and, and dreamt up, half cooked up tax grabs, as you've been seeing. They believe in centralisation and control in Wellington big time. They've added 14,000 bureaucrats down here. Do we want to do it piece by piece? I think we will. Remember, we've done this. There's about a half million public sector workers in New Zealand at the moment. So 14,000 is like 2 or 3%. So Mr. Luxon, remember what they do with the shell game. They they use the big number to make sure that it freaks you out rather than the little number, which is accurate. So they've added 2 or 3% to the public sector, right? 2 or 3% of workers. So that means National is going to come in and get rid of 2. And in fact, no, they're not. Because remember, we asked Michael Woodhouse, are you going to get rid of all 14,000? And he said, no, but there'll be a middle ground. So they'll get rid of seven and a half thousand. So they'll get rid of one and a half percent. And so Mr. Luxon is saying that Labor's bad, 14,000 MPs, we're going to get rid of 7,000 and make it 493,000, not 500,000 public sectors, and then it will be perfect. So just remember what that means, 14,000, in the context of uh, how many people there actually are. Um, should we just keep rolling? You want to you jump in there for anything? Uh, you want to yeah, jump in I, I, know. I, just, I just feel like a Christopher Luxon's people should have said, don't go on the show. But yeah, when it was decided that he absolutely is going on the show, it's like they're like, what do the listeners of the platform actually like? Oh, they like just a constant stream of shit. And <laughs> and Luxon's gone, hey, what's that thing we've got in the back of our marketing cupboard? If it, is it an old bucket of shit? I'll take that along. Let's see if they like it. Yeah, it is actually. You know, they talk about Trump doing the oldies, the oldies but the goodies. Some of them oh, come out. Nothing but I, the hits. I was I wasn't going to spoil you. I was going to let it come up. But he he goes to the forty six percent of children being at school, which has been debunked to his face by Susie Ferguson. Has been debunked multiple times here by us giving you the real numbers. But he still goes to it because he knows what. within this media cycle that the that if he says it. Some people believe it, and then they pass it on, and they it's actually it's actually now is officially disinformation that yep. it's officially that because he's been he's been fact checked to his face by Susie Ferguson. Let alone, obviously, I think they already know what the truth is, but he, we've heard it. We've heard he's it not being fact checked on the platform. No, he's got well, he's check. got a smooth ride. Well, he does get fact checked. He does get fact checked about why you're learning to speak Maori because that's obviously oh, one of the of fucking issues of the day. Let's keep going. And they believe in identity politics and pitching groups in New Zealanders against each other. So they're doing that damage to themselves. From the National Party perspective, if you think about where we were nine months ago, which was in a pretty hopeless position given all the dysfunction that had been going on, um, our job first and foremost is to make sure we get our own uh, team and game sorted, which I think we had done. Uh, And then our goal is to be a mainstream political party. That means we have to make sure that we're attractive to one out of every two voters that are walking down the main street of Auckland. Uh, or anywhere in this country. And oh, so quick save, you remember quick, that quick save, quick, quick save. They are farmers, 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 farmers as well, farmers as well. 113,892 people that voted for Labour. They didn't do anything funky and go to ACT or New Zealand First or anyone else. They went straight through to Labour. Uh, and so there's a third of people, I reckon, that sit on the Labour side pretty locked in where they are. There's a third that sit on our side pretty locked in where they are. And there's a third in the middle that voted for Helen Clark, voted for... And yeah, they're the people you're for, pitching for. So just what I'm hearing, what I'm that's hearing in a roundabout way well, is... That's my job, yeah. to make sure we're, we're yeah. getting as much of the mainstream and big vote as we can. Yeah. There you go. Clip number one done. It's interesting that I, I'm surprised that that Plunkett can't even not interrupt, the, the you know, the probably the biggest interview they've had, right? I mean, like, I'm not saying that, like, mm. to dismiss them, but, you know, he's a, he's a good get. He's a really good get. Yeah, yeah. And we, I mean... Uh, yeah, yeah, he's a good get. So he's pro- possibly the biggest one they've had. So, but he, but he still can't bring himself to not interrupt him, which is fascinating. Right, that's clip number one. Clip number two. Shall I just keep rolling? Yeah. Um, Rip the band-aid. Uh, this is this is now the big important issues of the day. Now, I think that Christopher Luxon's team tomorrow will be like, um, not tomorrow because it's Saturday. Today might be like, oh, because there are some questions that are still very, very, very. Um, what's the word, uh, debatable in society today. Now, I'm not saying uh-huh. that I think they're debatable or Chewy thinks 
thinks they're debatable. There, there. You want to touch fingers? Ouch. Ouch. That'd be really <laughs> hard to do. <laughs> it is, it is. Okay, I'll stay still. You can do it. Man, you have your big hands, bro. Um, you know what they say about people with big hands. Um, is that this I'm is a debate it. going on going on in society at the moment, and it's an and it's an uncomfortable on some areas. Um, and Luxon wouldn't want to have answered some of these questions, and he's gone a, on a somewhat friendly, quote unquote, platform, and he's been asked questions that he wouldn't have to want to answer because they're ones that are causing uh, consternation in society. So, guess what the first one is, Chewy? <clears throat> Oh, it's just such a grab bag. What's it, what's right. in the bucket of shit? Let's, let's talk let's, about let's gender. Let's put our hand in and see what chunk I can pull out there. We'll talk about gender. That's what we're going to do. Um, how Ooh. many biological genders do you think there are in humans? So before we go any further, Mr. Plunkett doesn't even understand the theories behind these. Biology, sex, not biological gender. Gender, different. Biological sex so how many biological sexes are there could be a que- uh, could be a valid question albeit completely boring but it, but at least it would be an accurate question biological genders so so to start with the question makes no logical sense but of course mr luxon answers it and this is where i'm sure his handlers are going do we really maybe you shouldn't put say put anything slap the phone what, out of his what fucking should we hand. do i don't know uh, I think there's two biological genders. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. transgender rights in sports and stuff is up to sports institutions to determine how they handle it. Uh, oh, so you haven't got Ooh. a position on whether or not women's sporting events should be for natural and biological women? Uh, I think that's my that's my preference, but ultimately it's left to each individual sports organisation. Okay, so, but your preference is that Women play with women and blokes play with blokes. Okay. Like Luxon's team will be going, this we don't want to have this conversation. It's not gonna like like I'm not even making commentary on whether it should be had this conversation, but his team will be going, We don't want this to be clipped. We don't want this <laughs> go out there. Compete, sorry. Compete. You gotta find a way so that you can actually have biological people, uh, you know, biological folk that actually <laughs> don't have any undue or perceived unfairness going on in their sports, and that's for their sports bodies to determine. All right, you've answered that question, I think, uh, to anyone who was listening pro- properly. What is the role of the Treaty of Waitangi in the constitutional oh, arrangements of New Zealand? Me. And are you fully committed to one person, one vote? Or yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, can, yeah. Can I just, I want to point out something that I always say. They might not be aware of this, but we get two votes. <laughs> we get a party vote and we get an electoral vote. Why, I mean, like, I, I kind of get the concept they're talking about, but by definition in New Zealand, we have, all of us have two votes. So what is mm-hmm. this thing they keep going on about? Here's the deal, right? I mean, we are one country. Uh, we have a single system. Of- I think he was talking to Don Brash just before he came on this morning between me and you. Delivery of public services. We target people on the basis of need, not ethnicity. We're all equal under the law. One person, one vote. That's been our position, and it remains our position. Will so be. we've said it before: disabled people, your car parks are going. I am sorry, uh, pensioners, your your retirement money is going because you are not entitled under the law to receive something based on your age that I'm not entitled to get. One person, one law. We're all the same under the law. So just be aware that Mister Mister Luxton is actively saying he's going to get rid of the pension. And he's actively saying he's going to get rid of disabled car parks, along with a whole bunch of other things as well. Because if we're all the same under the law, there can be no advantage. Or oh, hang on, Chewy, is he only talking about race? Hmm. Mm. That might no. be the case. Might be the case. Well, now here's a question: that that no one gets a different treatment due to their race. What if that race of people? requires something that the other sectors of society don't require. What if that oh, race I of people yeah, yeah. requires a certain level of attention or help or aid that other groups don't? What do we do then? Do we go, sorry, you can't have it? Because even though your life expectancy and health outcomes are so much worse than the other races, you're just going to have to die five or six years earlier and your health outcomes are going to have to be worse because even though your race requires more help, fuck you. 
Is that kind of if I summarise that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, it, and, and I find that really interesting that a, a man of his ethnicity, background, uh, upbringing, uh, and age uh, has a really, really good concept of equality and not equity. Mm. And for someone that talks a lot about outcomes, has absolutely no concept of what that actually means. Um. I, I love Caitlin, just between me and you. I know that might be a bit appropriate to pronounce that publicly. Um, and I know Caitlin's got a tongue in her cheek slightly because it's not necessarily a law, but this is this is gold. Wait, if we're all equal under the law, why does sport need to be segregated? Different rules hmm. for different people. I think it's, it's a very like interesting. It's always been like that. It's all an interesting philosophical conversation, although we will acknowledge there is no criminal activity or legal situations going on there. I'll keep going. I'll keep going. I, I need to say, it's like, a, you know, you have, um, what do you have it when you, you have that little bit of uh, like yogurt between courses to cleanse the palate? It's like we need to have a rant to cleanse the palate as we're going through. Um, so, so disabled car parks going, uh, pensions going, uh, you know, uh, working for families is going because it's not fair if you've got kids and you're getting a tax credit that people who don't get kids aren't getting. So that's going myriad of things. I guess that means, you know, how in the house they get, you can't be done for libel when you're in the house, mm -hmm. your special privileges that's going. Cause you're not allowed to libel someone. If I'm not, we're going to be all equal under the law, all equal under the law. Here we go. That position. So that's our view. And that's why we've been opposed to the code governance of public services, you know, because that is a very different thing. And the frustration on this one is that the government hasn't actually made its case for what they're talking about with respect to co-governance. We care about getting outcomes for Māori or non-Māori. The bit? bottom line is outcomes are all going backwards. Educational attainment, health, um, you know, weight lines, deadlines, housing crisis, crime's going up, economy's going backwards. That's for everybody. But we need a single system, not two systems. And we need to target people on need, not, not ethnicity and all equal under the law. So yeah. that's why we believe, uh, that's what we believe very, very strongly. I also am pretty happy that he's saying we need one system. So you know how there's incredible amounts of empirical data that go if you've got less melanin in your skin or more money in your bank balance, the justice system treats you slightly differently. You know how that goes? Oh, very that differently. Works? Very different. So, I've uh, experienced this personally, and we know that the National Party thrive on anecdotes. So... <laughs> So you know the um, the diversion system, yep. right? You do a non-violent crime, um, you know you can you can get away from a conviction, uh, but you can only have that once. I've had it twice. I know of people oh. with a different complexion from me uh, who have never had it once, straight to court. So. You know, it's it's all bullshit. It, it, it's a lovely thing to say that we're all equal under the law. That has been debunked. Yeah. Well, or else what he's saying. Your skin, the harsher you're going to get treated in court, the longer sentences you'll generate. Your interactions with police are almost always worse. And getting more brown faces in the police has somewhat changed that but certainly not as much as it should and mm. pe these people they never look at the whys they just look at well this is the way things are now they never look at the reasons why it's the way it is now yeah all right um let's go on to the next part because, because of course if you're speaking to mr plunkett at some stage you have to have to have to have some kind of tirade on the evil mainstream media. The news um, media play a huge part in how uh, various points of views are portrayed in society. And I have argued, and part of the platform is that I think they've done a poor job and I think they encourage the sort of divisiveness that, that uh, concerns you. I yep. do not think it's they the are politically fault. neutral often. Do you think the National Party gets a fair crack from the media? And do you think the media is doing a good job? And I'm talking about legacy and mainstream media. Legacy and mainstream media, like you know, the Herald and News Talk, their biggest radio station in the country, those kinds of places. There's such woke fuckwits over there, and they just never give lux in a break. The AM show, you know, those sorts of places. There's just everything's the bloody, against the bloody uh, communist rag that is the Herald. Yeah, I know. In helping New Zealanders understand the country they live in and what's going on in it. 
Um, well, I think what we, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, what I'd say to you is, look, from my perspective, the first thing has been to make sure the National Party isn't the media, it isn't in the news, uh, you know, which has been a lot of the last two or three years was just the drama. Did you get that? You hear what he said? That's really important. He doesn't want National to be in the news. He does want to be in the background. He wants all the news focus to be on Labour. He said it. He just said it. The first thing, I'll, I'll go back a few seconds in case you missed it. He's very, he's very clear. He doesn't want national. I'm not, this is not a joke. I know I've been tongue in cheek. He actually said the first thing and the most important thing is national's not in the news. So he's actively saying, yes, we'll sit in our basement. And what he would be saying is let Labour implode. I don't know if Labour will implode. But he's actively saying we're going to put nothing out there. We're going to sit back, which is what we've been saying since we started this whole little thing. I'll play it again. Just, I've, I've got to go back 13 seconds. Um, well, I think what we, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, that's a big question. Um, what I'd say to you is, look, from my perspective, the first thing has been to make sure the National Party isn't the media, it isn't in the news. Uh, you it know, isn't in the been, news. A lot of the last two or three years was just the dramas that, and that reality TV show well. that the National Party had become at that point in time. So, you know, stop being in the news is the first thing. I think the second thing for us, you know, that I've learned is that you've got to focus really clearly, you know, even from day one, from being the new leader nine months ago. You know, we've just said, look, there is a cost of living crisis. Actually, this is the government soft on crime. Actually, the healthcare system oh, is falling apart. Talking point, talking it's a shameful that only 46% of our kids go to school regularly. You know, and Not true! Support. Did you hear it? Not so, true! 46 So, So it's been debunked to his face by Susie Ferguson and other fantastic broadcasters like us. Not to his face, though. To this face, but not to his actual face. Um, and he's still saying it. So this is this is the active... Um, the active disinformation now. So Christopher Luxon is now part of the disinformation cycle yep. because he he knows without question that number is not accurate now, right? That's from term one, and there's lots of reasons for that. We've talked it all through. Go back and look through our videos, um, and cr including half of term one, we were under COVID rules that if someone in your house or, or if you were a, a friend of someone with COVID, you had to spend seven days at home. Not even a household contact. Household contact came through about halfway through term one. So don't do that. That's really off-putting. Stop it. Sheesh, child. Um, so it's been debunked. They know it's not true. He knows it's not true. And if he didn't know it's not true, he's been told that by Susie mm. Ferguson, and he's still saying it. That is the definition of disinformation. At one point, you could say maybe they aren't clear on it. There is no way to now say they're not clear on it. He's still saying it. That explains a hashtag that I have seen doing the rounds. Oh, what was it? Lying Luxon. Okay. <laughs> Often paired with national not fit to govern, which has been bubbling away for like four years now. Um, yeah. Look, it, it, if this is the road that he wants to go, like, sure, it's not going to win. And it's, I think it's actively making the New Zealand political scene worse maybe yeah Look, i mean I, I when you say it's not not going to win i mean you know it's please. it's okay it, I, it i'll might. change it please don't let it win <laughs> are we going to keep going let's play some more economy's going backwards you know big time so you know all of by focusing on a few messages rather than barking at every passing car uh, and every issue that's going down you end up actually focusing the media and eventually now if you start to pick up the front pages of the any mainstream media bulletin, uh, you start to see those issues or those stories being told. So that's the way, that's the bits that I can control because frankly, just sitting and winching and complaining about the media doesn't make, you know, doesn't get you anywhere. So you just got to get on and play with the yeah. ref that you're kind of given. No, but look, but look, at least that's a half by decent answer. He's basically saying to Lux, uh, to Plunkett, yeah, the media's doing fine with us. You know, that's basically what he's saying in that point. He said some other things, but at that point he's like, whatever. Got to get on with it. You got to. He's basically saying you got to play the ball. Uh, your bold play each, each ball on its merits. Whatever that sports ball saying is. Yep. You know something you can only play the cards out. Something like that about balls and docking. So I think um, the only thing I'd say is that you know when you see things like the merger of Radio New Zealand and TV New Zealand, you know I just don't understand that stuff because or what the reason for why or what the problem is that we're trying to solve with a thing like that. Because we're spending almost four hundred million dollars doing that, that, but but why are we doing it? Are we does it negate the plurality of media voices in the market? Does it have two very different cultures? What are we trying to achieve? It's going to be a big monopoly. So if you run it past the Commerce Commission, like you would other media transactions, so there's some. 
stuff going on because we're a small country with a small market. Um, you want to make sure you've got a maximum plurality of voices, and I guess that's what you're doing as well, providing to that oh. plurality. Yeah, which is uh, why yeah, you should come yeah. on more often, Chris. Oh, God. Uh, to, to yeah, <laughs> um, I'm enjoying the conversation, mate. It's good. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no. Look, 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 it is good. <laughs> it's not. I just, just as an impartial observer, it's not. By the way, it's not good. Um, so I've got a gap here going on to our next next part of this conversation, but this is this is we're I've programmed a small break, Chewy, to see if you want to add anything to the conversation so far. Does incoherent screaming fit in? Yeah, um, sure, sure. like I I love it when someone like Luxon goes, I don't understand. That that should be something that is is banned from any potential leader going because it, it does. It makes you sound fucking stupid. The the Radio New Zealand merger, whether you agree with it or not, it's not hard to understand. It just makes them sound dumb. Well, it's not even not even that it makes it sound dumb. It makes them sound um, hypocritical because surely one of the things that's going to happen, which is not, I don't think, the best thing for journalists, is if you have now a combined newsroom, you're going to have fewer journalists. That, that goes without saying, which yeah. is going to cost less to run, which is going to be a consolidated group of people. How can the National Party be going, no, 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 we want a bigger, they're basically saying, we, I don't see a reason we're doing this. We want a bigger and more, more difficult bureaucracy here, whereas everything else is like less bureaucracy. I just remembered, um, uh, th this is kind of something that's hidden in, in Luxon's background. You, you may not be familiar with it, but he, did you know he used to run an airline? I had never heard that. No, okay. So he used to run an airline. Um, that airline was um, pretty much mostly government-owned and is a monopoly. Yeah. That's interesting. He was yeah, okay with it then. It? Yeah, I guess hmm. so. $5.7 or something for his salary. I think it was. Yeah. I think he got asked about. Um, all right. So this is the next part. And this is one of the parts that's going to, you, Che, I apologize. If you guys have enjoyed spending time with Chewy, um, I'm a, I apologize that this is the point that he literally explodes and we don't get to hang out with Chewy anymore. So yeah. just if you, if, if a head exploding is something that, um, that you, you is distasteful for you, you might want to look away. Um, yeah. uh, you have been learning to Rio. Why? Oh, well, actually, I grew up in an era where we didn't learn it at school. You know, I went to school in Christchurch, and it yeah. wasn't really an option at that time. Yeah. And then I, I actually um, was away for over 16 years. And then yeah. when I was at Air New Zealand, I wanted to try and, um, you know, learn it a little bit. And that was why? actually a back. Well, can, can I step in here? There's a couple of reasons. I don't know why Mr. Luxon's using it, but because it's an incredibly commercially viable language in New Zealand. If you speak Māori, if you're fluent in Māori, you are on the top other than working for the platform, obviously, you're on the top of every CV list for pretty much, if not every, certainly the most jobs in New Zealand. So I'm not saying this is why Mr. Luxon's doing it, but in New Zealand, it is an incredibly commercial language. Where do we live, Chewy? I forget. We, Where... we, we live in New Zealand. Ah. Or Aotearoa. As, so in as other words, learning like Māori, like hearing. learning Māori and being able to speak Māori in this country would be incredibly commercially advantageous. Just, just throwing it out there. Just Can before I also we kind make of get the point points. Sure. That Luxon's been saying that he's been learning Toreo for what over over a year and a half. I've ne still never heard him say Kia ora. Not a one. single fucking phrase. Yeah. Have, have yeah. I ever heard him say at any point? Where's yeah. the proof? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, when you start, like I, I I can play the ukulele, okay, when you start learning how to do it, you want to do it everywhere. So if you could speak right. Māori, if you're starting to learn how to speak Māori, why why would you hide your light under a bushel, which would be a reference that Mr. Luxon would understand quite well. Uh, all right, let's keep going and finding out why he's wasting so much time learning Māori. Kuh. Yeah. Well, I just got it's something that I think is important and something that I kind of want to mark. Well, you know, why I, is it? No, but I'm asking you why is it important? Because some would say it's just yeah, a virtue signal. Chris. You would say. You would say no, that's some. rubbish. No, that's rubbish. I'm so, so in what practical it. ways in your everyday yeah. life would you be using Toreo? How many oh, other I fluent Toreo speakers do you work with on a day to day basis or interact with on a day to day Everyone's basis? Everyone's got to be instantly yeah, fluent. Well, yeah. Instantly well, but the, fluent. But the other thing is this, yeah, right? I can I can juggle, right? I taught myself to juggle. Um, I, I actually went and worked with some people on how to juggle. Um, I wanted to learn how to juggle. Uh, according to, uh, Mr. Plunkett, 
What way are you going to use that skill in every day of your life? Well, in instantly, just, with no no wind but, up, no learning. Who's fluent? You've got to talk but, it every day. But but he was trying to make it sound like why would what what reason have you got to use it? Where are you going to use it? That doesn't even matter. I I want to juggle. I want to speak Maori. I want to yeah. understand it. There doesn't have to be a reason. There may be a reason for Mr. Luxon. I don't know, but there doesn't have to be a reason. And look, as we always say about walking and chew gum, credit to Christopher Luxon with these answers. He's telling, he's telling Plunkett that he's basically an idiot. He goes, no, no, that's ridiculous. That's stupid. So good on him. I mean, credit where credit's due on some kind of weird boomer, blooming whatever way he is pushing back against this ridiculous narrative by Sean Plunkett thinking that we're actually able that, that there's a there needs to be a reason to learn a language. I I, I learned Latin when I was at school because I went to a Catholic boarding school. What, when was I going to use that in everyday language? But I guarantee you, if I went and and spoke to no, never going to happen. And if I were if I was able to speak Latin, which I can't, he wouldn't go. Well, what's the point in that? He'd go. Oh, that's really interesting. It's weird how like if I spoke French or German or something else that I didn't couldn't really use in New Zealand, that would be an interesting part. Of of my you know my character, but apparently speaking Māori is actually there's a waste of time, yeah. waste of time. And it's altogether. a question that answers themselves. Your your answer is right. Why are you you you're learning another language? Because I want to, as a yeah. as a whole complete sentence. Yeah. But also, I want to be prime minister of New Zealand. <laughs> is also a solid self evident answer to that. Yeah. Uh, Neon says Karen Plunkett <laughs> could do with some studio setup lessons. Uh, why does BHN look sound so much better than the platform? Because you, you know why? Because Neon help us set it up. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, I'm never going to be fluent because I'm, I'm finding it pretty hard. Um, but I'm wanting to do it, and I've wanted to do it for probably a decade or more because um, I actually want to be able to know some Tadeo. I think it's important. Um, it's no different from like when I lived in Canada, right? You know, it was compulsory to learn some English and some French. You had to speak both. You have to have actually in Canada, you've got to have equal prominence of both languages on packaging and and, and everything. Weird. Um, all, other countries, uh, hang on, what, hang on. Other countries where the majority what? language is English, they sometimes have other la Oh, my God. It's really funny here how Plunkett doesn't back down, but he, he could, I mean, if you were watching his face, I suspect what you'd see is this. Mm. So we can't push this barrow now because he's made some salient and cogent points back against what I'm saying. He's stumbled into the exact point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tarot is not for everybody. I appreciate something I've got no interest to it. That's fine. Uh, you should be able to navigate the New Zealand system without um, and have choice to be able to use English or Tarot if you want to. Um, but I, from my point, my point of view, it's just something I've always wanted to do. Done. Just something I always wanted to do. What a twonk is old uh, Sean Plunkett. One more bit. Can we handle one more bit? Yes, before I because this has been kind of this is this is the you know how we've talked about what the platform's alt right um, QAnon audience is trying to try and do a true. So he had to ask a question about the protest at Wellington because how could you not? Obviously, he had to. Yeah. Uh, and actually, Mister Luxon again, give him credit. Basic basically says because they're all fucking nutters. That's basically the answer. He's a bit more diplomatic than that, but why didn't you go and talk to them? Because they're all they're all fucking nuts. Why would I go talk to nutty people? That's I, I'm I'm paraphrasing for the sake of expedience, but that's basically what he says. You have been learning to Rio. Why? Oh, what's Don't, happening? Hang on. Hang on. It's all what's gone wrong. Here? It's all gone wrong. Must, must be this one. Didn't that didn't happen? Do you regret not talking to some of those people who are on the front lawn at Parliament during that protest? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a difficult one, to be honest, because no, the way no. the protest arrived, um, it felt to me like the leaders sort of shot through after the first day or so, and you ended up with a very disparate group of people, and there actually wasn't a consistent uh, bunch, you know, a consistent you know, group to be able to talk to that could deliver, the, could deliver the, the group. And the second thing that wasn't really cool or appreciated by anyone, frankly, and Wellington citizens in particular, was just the way that people and residents in that area were treated and also just some of the you know, aggression and assert, you know, assertiveness, you know, just not following the law or being you know, peaceful and lawful about it. So, I mean, you know, I get it. Um, and, but the reality was, I think, you know, from my perspective, he's showing up with a bit more respect and done, you know, being peaceful and lawful. Uh, and instead of abusing, you know, kids going to school and throwing eggs at stuff. Because they know, were just, fucking just nutters. Were they, were they a river of on. filth? Were they Nazis? Were they white supremacists? N no, no, no. They were people who well, had genuine concerns, but they didn't manage it well. No, but this is, this is, this answer is Luxon saying, but I need their vote. 
He's actually already said they were they he's actually already said they were a river of filth. He's talked about them throwing, he's talked about throwing eggs, he's actually described that. But mm-hmm. then when when uh, Plunkett tries to set him up to to kind of a softball him to try and get these votes, he kind of he kind of pulls back a little bit because he needs their votes. And that's as we've said on this uh, conversation before, that's Luxon's dilemma as well. Right, it's one of his dilemmas is he ha- how to court the people who are making huge amounts of racist commentary on his uh, Facebook page when he wrote Marty, how to court them, right, and have them on his side and vote for him without acknowledging them. That's one of the problems that Mr. Luxon has. Probably every politician, to be fair, has it on some level, but that's one one of Mr. Luxon's issues. And so he has to court these, um, you know, QAnon voters because if they all go and vote for Brian Tamaki, guess what? Labor gets in. Do you know what I mean? Like, they, you know, like there was some, you know, there was some concerns. There was some, but but again, that was the other thing that was very hard to work out. What was the protest about? Was it just anti-authority? Was it about yeah. mandates? Was it about, you know, there was a whole well, bunch I guess, of Well, Chris, Chris, you're not going to find out what it's about if you don't go down and talk with them. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe, but Fuck. well, actually, the, the quid pro quo was, you know, show up, be lawful, be legal, um, and and find someone who can represent and deliver the group, and they couldn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I just think it's one of the most interesting things I've seen um, as a New Zealander for a long and time. I, and I understand the sense of and I've met with people and you know individually, you know, say in my you know in my electorate office who've raised those issues and concerns with me, very intelligently, very respectfully, and and and, and panda, you know, very panda, articulately, panda, panda, which panda. has been good. But actually, in in the rabble of that protest, that was difficult. Mm. Certainly, I would say not helped by Trevor Mallard um, um, would be one of my other observations. Yeah. Hey, you know. would you- there we go. So that's the end of it. You've got through it. Well done to you all. I've only lost about half the audience, <laughs> um, but that's that's where we are at. So uh, the the conversation's twenty six minutes long. People can go and watch it. You're welcome to go and watch it. But it was a mixture of uh, set up softballs that weren't hit out of the park. Which it looked like it, uh, it kind of upset Plunkett a little bit because Luxon. Remember, uh, Plunkett said to me when I did a podcast with him that he considered um, Christopher Luxon to be a bit woke. So I'm guessing he was exper- exper- expecting those things, like you know, not wanting to talk to the River of Filth as they were dubbed by some, not me, but by some, and wanting to speak Maori. And you know, I guess on some level you'd got to say of, of Mr. Luxon, he didn't he didn't fall into all of those tropes but there was plenty in there the the greatest hits were there the ones that have been disproven and the ones that are um, easy to disprove as well shall we i want people to remember that he stooped to go on the shit show platform mm. like, oh, i thought you about us no 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 our we're, shit show we're, we're, <laughs> we're a completely different class hey we use the shit we, we we use the hashtag which is share our shit so yeah we are <laughs> this is a shit show absolutely share our shit <laughs> um you know, when he's holding himself up as a potential, you know, option for leader of this country, can we realize that he just wouldn't have stumbled into the platform? They know exactly who Sean Plunkett is, and they they even a cursory look at their uh, online footprint would tell you exactly what audience that Christopher Luxon is is delivering himself to. Um, and I, I think he should be showered with all of the criticism that is due for that decision. He's cheapened himself, and he's really shown um, who he's willing to pander to. It, it's yeah. Shithouse. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true as well. And I do wonder, like, you know, forget the substance of the conversations, if that is even a word I could use. There are some conversations in there that politicians don't want to have. Because politicians, all of them on some level, want to be as much wallpaper as they can mm. to not offend anybody. They want to be trying uh, to be like accessible to everybody. And some of those questions, which were directly and completely for Sean Plunkett's alt-right QAnon audience, by Chewy, um, actually, I suspect the um, the people who were uh, who put him in that interview, his his press people would not have been all that happy about that. So, oh, hi, Joey. Um, oh, I should so, change yeah. where that back button is. That's a bad oh, place you, to have a back you button. You hang up on yourself. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so, yeah, look, it's I, 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 I'm interested to see if he goes on again uh, because I don't know if Plunkett's audience will be national voters in general. I think they'll probably be ACT voters and probably all the fringe parties. Um, yep. But... 
you know, it's going to be close. Look, I'm telling you a year out, it's going to be close. And if, if, if Luxon can pick up 1%, of that audience that otherwise would go to destiny or act or someone else that might be the difference with a you know a, a center right to right government versus not so maybe he will continue to go to the opening of a paper bag he'll never deem himself to come with us i mean i'm banned from the uh, facebook page but um it depends if we're if we're if we're if we're humongous next year then they'll all come with us so come on guys get working share our shit <laughs> um I, I i have had a comment in the in the pocket for most of of this whole segment and i've really got to put it out there it's, it's there the go. big issue you haven't mentioned it by the way oh, okay so th this is completely slid slid by you can we just point out the fact the that desk. sean's <laughs> desk is backwards yeah it is weird that isn't it it is weird it, yeah. it it seems inconvenient but yes that is that is one backwards desk i wonder if it's because they get a guest in on this side and if it was the other way around it would be harder to get a guest over here but it is a bit bizarre like that that is that is a, a reasonably non-expensive office desk mm -hmm. you can get from an office supply place surely <laughs> however many million dollars that he's got he could have got something a little bit more appropriate to his station i like what's going on at the moment here when i say i'm banned from their facebook page i'm banned too caitlin also banned so we're going we're, we're actually we've actually got a we've got a bunch of rebels watching this we've to got pick up troublemakers here why what's going Am on I... Oh, I'm just, yeah. just saying like if i'm not banned then you, you bloody what, moderate you too you bloody moderate you sure <laughs> moderate i've never even been on their page they banned me without even being on their page ever i mean but, collins banned me pretty hard yeah i liked it yeah uh, yeah new zealand national party where are we you weren't banned the other day because we had to use your page because i was mummy and daddy bank rollers can't get oh, can sign piece, up says no, not banned not oh, bad. Show us what what are they got what are they got up there at the moment. I bet you they haven't got a fucking platform on there. But you anything you like, the platform's not on that page. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's have a look here. Spent, little... spent, spent 20 minutes this morning speaking to the alt-right conspiracy theorists. It was a great time and a great chat had by all. Nope, no, sure. nothing in there. Wrong just again. just no. scroll down. That's all right. You can have your weirdo screen thing going on. I like my vertical. Uh, anything from so, this yeah, morning? We've got memes. We got Just look at the dates this morning. Have you gone past this morning? Eight hours, six hours, two hours ago. Oh, here we go. Nicola Willis and I are hearing the same messages from businesses across New Zealand. And I bet it's not, man, that wage subsidy certainly saved my <laughs> business and delivered profits to my shareholders. Um, they're losing confidence in this woeful government and couldn't be more clear in the new zealand herald's mode of the boardroom what the fuck is that is that something that i've missed but, but you know but the hey but this is the boardroom oh, this is but this is fine this like you know if labor was it's smart like a romance novel that i would never <laughs> want to read now that's the nude of the ballroom. Um, oh. but this is but this is perfect. And this is where unfortunately we were talking the other day about you know how how the right is better with their messaging and stuff. Labor should run with that. Yes, national, you are the party of the boardroom. We are the party of the factory floor. Yes, national, you can be the party of the big office, the Fortune 500. We're the party that that feeds the money to make those people wealthy. If they were smart, they'd get into it and they'd find their messaging. But unfortunately, they're not that smart. And that is why we have a 50-50 election rather than every Western country, in my opinion, and in a fair amount of research as well, but I can't say for everyone, if you, if you poll population and get a fair representation it always comes back that there are far more left-wing ideologies than right-wing and this is the thing get your messaging right yes national they're right they are the party of the boardroom they are the party of the ceo they are the party of the investor we are the party of the factory floor we are the party of the worker we are the party of the small business trying to struggle so we give them a wage subsidy do it accept it labor go for it push it Fucking hell. Get out the red anyway. flag. Um, also, in surprising news, I was banned from Sean Plunkett's page, but am no longer. Oh, he bans and unbanned. He's, he's banned and unbanned me about three times, bro. Don't, you'll probably be banned tomorrow again. 
And I'm back with Judith. Ah. Oh, but you've got a new Twitter account. That's why. No, no, I'm talking Facebook. Okay, fair enough. Hey, let's um, let's have a look at this last story. I kind of feel like this last story is more your bag, baby, than mine. Um, and I was going to show a couple of clips. Well, really two clips, because today uh, either hundreds or potentially thousands of students were marching in the street. It depends what news you watch to, see, to either hear this. Thousands of students around the country ditched school this afternoon. To- or if you watch TVNZ, you heard... Hundreds of students have skipped school and joined other climate change protests. <laughs> I'm being a little bit facetious because if it was 3,000 people, then that's 30 lots of 100 and 3 lots of But Isn't it funny how different places sell it differently, either hundreds or thousands? Uh, so these are the young activists talking about all our troublemakers in the chat there. Uh, this is the next generation of people being banned from the National Party Facebook page. Actually, none of these kids will have Facebook. Getting banned from the National Party Instagram account or TikTok account, that's what that's what these people are. Just rallying in cities across the country today. The New Zealand events helped kick off a day of global protest. As Abby Wakefield reports, Kiwi demonstrators are renewing calls for our government to take more action on yes. the environment. From the north to the south. <laughs> to the beehive's front door. The same message echoed throughout New Zealand. The climate emergency gets more dire every day and our elected representatives are sticking their heads in the sand and refusing to think about our future. This year's school strike for climate protests come after a series of severe weather events across the globe. We've seen extreme flooding here too, from Northland to Nelson and Dunedin. Niwa says it was our wettest winter on record. This is a a catastrophe that's, you know, going to be worse than the pandemic and we're doing less about it, it seems like. Among their demands, the protesters want to halve New Zealand's cow population and ban the use. I was just going to check. That means halve the numbers, not cut them all in half, eh? Because now, cutting them all in half would would um, sort of oh, lost my train of thought. That would end all the cows, but you'd end up with more halves. But okay, I've lost my mind of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. We need to focus on agriculture first, and agriculture doesn't actually come into the scheme until 2025 in the um, carbon emissions trading scheme, and we don't think that's good enough. We want to see the action being taken now. Remember this? I move government notice of motion number one in my name regarding a declaration of a climate emergency. That declaration was almost two years ago now, and today protesters have gathered across the country calling for the government to treat climate climate change for the crisis that it is. I, I do wonder about this shot. I wonder if she walked to all those kids and went, hey, now, when I walk past you with the camera, just keep looking straight ahead. Don't turn and look, because notice none of them look at the camera and none of them look at her. She's like, we're going to do a really, a really good shot. It'll be on the news. You'll be on the news, but just keep looking forward. Don't look at me. Don't acknowledge the camera at all. Thanks, guys. I think the government needs to take urgent action on climate change, and I think they're not going to unless people come out and protest and tell them that they have to. I constantly say that we haven't done enough. You know, that we've done a lot, but we really are only just getting rolling. As our world leaders meet at the United Nations, the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine has dominated discussions, but there's been some talk of climate change too. There is another battle we must end our suicidal war against nature. The climate crisis is the defining issue of our time. Time, something these protesters say we're running out of. Abby Wakefield, One News. Time, something these protesters say we're running out of. Abby Wakefield, in my journalist voice. Um, Yeah, Chewy, the thing I love about this is is these are the 40-year-olds who will be in Parliament, mm-hmm. you know, making decisions. And if they're, even if, you know, cutting the cow population in half, I mean, honestly, that's not that's not going to happen anytime soon. That's not going to be legislated. You know, we're a, dairy, we're a dairy country, whether that's good or bad, it's not, it's not, it's just not anytime soon going to happen. But I, I, I did a debate with um, Julianne Genter in a, in a, in a property developer and what julianne Genta was saying about their you know a um what is it a quality affordable home is a human right what she was saying is 
because my question was like, well, what if it's quality, but it's not affordable? Or what if it's, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's affordable, but, but it's not quality. How do you do this? And her thing was like, well, it's an aspiration for the future. You know, like 20 years ago, we were saying things that are only happening now. So if we set up these aspirations now, they're for the future. So the thing I love about these young people is they've got big ideas. And even though we can't, necessarily i can't necessarily maybe chill you disagree with me see how that would happen anytime soon it could be aspirational for 20 years from now when they are in their 30s and 40s these guys um making differences and making changes and it reminded me as i was watching that sure you know that old saying about if you're not um th this old saying which is wrong by the way but i'll use it anyway that if you're not if you're not a liberal when you're young you've got no heart and if not you, if you're not conservative when you're old you've got no brain christ i hate uh, that saying do you know why it's wrong but it's wrong it's wrong because it's not that as you get older you get more you get conservative it's that the generations after us get more progressive so in other that words, i like but it's true that's what happens you just think about rather than going those 60 year olds are so conservative compared to us those 60 year olds were fucking rocking around in the 1960s and their parents were going what the fuck and then in the in the 80s when that happened to the six people from the 60s they were more progressive so so me as a Gen Xer, I mean, the the guys coming along after me, the, the Gen Y and Gen Z, they are far more progressive as a, as a as a body than the mm. Gen Xers as a body. So, to the younger people, the older people look conservative, even if we're not. They look conservative. So it's not that you become conservative; as that to the younger people who are now more liberal, the older people look more conservative, and that's what the actual truth is. I believe it's my theory, but I believe that. You you say look maybe twenty years from now twenty years from now we won't have glaciers. You know they've they've shrunk by more than half in in my lifetime, um, and the weather is dramatically different now than it was twenty years ago and twenty years before that. So I mean I how many of these kids are going to get absolutely frustrated in a lack of action and just go well fuck it I guess we're going to live Mad Max. That, well, that's, that, you know, the, that's the means about my retirement uh, plan is societal collapse. Is haha, <laughs> but also, oh shit, yeah, maybe. I mean, like, um, I, I, I might sound a bit defeatist, bro, but I'm like, the, just the idea of cutting cows in New Zealand in half. I guess what I would say without saying, oh, that's rid ridiculous, I'd probably say something like, well, actually, but what's the path? How would you ever do that? How's it going to happen in a country that lives off at the moment? That lives off dairy. I mean, I'm not. I'm not actually saying it like you're being stupid. It's not. A, I'm just saying the reality of life right now is it's an aspirational goal for the future. It's not going to happen in the next five years. So, how would it happen, and when would it happen? It's you know, you know what I'm saying. That's that's what I'm asking. Couple of things with that. When is this country going to learn its fucking lesson about putting all of our eggs in one basket? Sure. Two we baskets. used to be the company, uh, the country of wool and mutton until England told us to go fuck ourselves and it crashed <laughs> our economy. Yeah. And now we've gone, you know what, you know who likes um, dairy products? The Chinese. Let, let's do everything for that and we're going to completely screw our water table and we're so focused on a monoculture, which is just dairy. It's delivering huge profits. It's delivering huge growth is maintaining infinite growth at the expense of our environment and uh, our, our biosphere a good plan? I would say it's probably not. Um, so I, I think we need to diversify. And if it's something like saying, you know what, we need to get rid of half the cows and we need to look at where we keep cows, um, like using the Canterbury Plains for dairy production is insane using the Mackenzie Basin for dairy production. Insane. You know, um, the river that I grew up next to had all of my summer holidays next to used to be able to swim in and drink from. You cannot do that now. And the thing that has changed is on both sides of that river, it is not sheep anymore. It's cows. Yeah. Look, um, let me just, can I just repackage something? I'm not saying it can't happen or it won't happen. I'm saying it's not going to happen anytime soon. Like I'm, I'm not. Yeah, and, I mean, and, I'm, and that's depressing as fuck. 
Yeah, but it's but I guess what I'm being is not a defeatist, but a realist. And I'm not saying I'm actually not saying good, bad, or indifferent. I'm just saying it's not going to happen anytime soon. The aspirational goals of 15 year olds, I want them to reach for the absolute pinnacle, to go for the absolute best. And then when they are in their 30s and 40s and they are in those positions, you know, working for Greenpeace or working in Parliament or working as an advisor or you know, starting new technologies that can replace some of the things we're doing, they'll be the ones that get to do it and actually make the change and affect the change then because. There's nothing in place that I can see right now. This sounds defeatist, but I'm just being honest, where those changes can happen with the current system. So it needs a new system, and the new system, in my opinion, will come um, from the new generation. So this is the start of their journey, that they will see what they're looking for, possibly, in 20 years. If there's 20 years. What are they talking about? 20, 2050. Put your anal beads away. We've been through this. <laughs> Sorry. This is a very serious moment. I apologize. It was wrong with me. No, I, 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 I'm a little head up about it because it's just this. It, and we come back to the, the mood of the boardroom. Yeah. How how many societal ills and and things are that we we we've got to focus on growth. We've got to focus on infinite profit. And we've we've spoken about this, the massive amount of food that this country delivers for overseas markets while people were paying through the fucking nose in the supermarkets here so we can get food imported from somewhere else because that's better for their profits is just mental. Agreed. You know, Agreed. what? How do we, uh, here's a question for you, bro. How do we change that? How do we say? And I'm not, I'm not defending okay, the farmers right. here. No, hang on, hang I, on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Cool your little ginger self. No. Um, how do we say to a farmer that that you now must provide primarily to New Zealand or provide what's happening here, and stop selling offshore or stop selling, focusing as much? Or like, how do we say to a farmer that you that all you farmers now have to provide enough food within New Zealand to supply for New Zealand so we don't have to buy off. How does that actually happen? Um, so I, I you know, we've gonna, just started an hour long conversation, by the way, yeah, you are I, aware I, I of that. I was going to um, okay, unveil fine. this at a later date, but you forced okay. my hand. Um, okay. the, the trip is to vote for Chewy. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, under my benevolent dictatorship, I'm going to get shit done using I'm common good? sense because enough is enough. Um, these are things that I've learned from local body politics. Um, I think Caitlin's got it right in the chat. Thanos was right. Um, let's roll with that. That is also a plan at the moment. You know, look, it is one of those things. I am frustrated at a lack of action. I am frustrated at seeing 30 years of people going, fuck, maybe we should do something about this. And seemingly nothing changes. It is frustrating. If I was a 15-year-old looking at that, I, I would be frustrated. Though Those guys are looking at, you know, we're going, no, oh, we'll be dead. It won't matter. <laughs> these kids, <laughs> these kids are going to be living it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's that brutal, you know, and, and, and we, they have that little fucking hand holding session in Davos every year where they all agree, go, well, this is dangerous. And there's this huge global security risks and food production risks and um, massive populations around the equator are going to be migrating to our lovely countries and we should do something about it. But, but we're not. We're not. It is enormously um, frustrating. And, and you can just stick your fingers in your ears and just go, ah, oh, well, what can I do? You can vote for people that that promise more radical change but even at a polit political level radical change is as someone said in the in the comments uh james shaw being a, a <laughs> the dad that's got you half the week just trying his best <laughs> <laughs> you know? i um you've just mentioned davos mm. i know everyone will have seen this but i purely by chance came across this today so i'm going to play it this is my first time at davos and uh and I find it quite a bewildering experience, to be honest. I mean, 1,500 private yets have flown in here to hear Sir David Attenborough speak about, you know, how we're wrecking the planet. And uh, I mean, I hear people talk in the language of participation and justice and equality and transparency. But then, I mean, almost no one raises the real issue of tax avoidance, right? And of the rich just not paying their fair share. I mean, it feels like I'm at a firefighters conference and no one's allowed to speak about water. 
I mean, this is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid <laughs> philanthropy schemes. We can invite Bono once more. But <laughs> come on, it's we got to be talking about taxes. Yes. That's it. Taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is bullshit, in, in my opinion. I actually came because I do believe we have an issue here. Um, but I have to say, honestly, this is a very one-sided panel. That clip, you know, frankly, there's actually a, a better, there's a part of the clip that, that he missed. I wonder if I can, I, I picked a, I wasn't I, one I, I, I exactly want to vote right. for that man for Yeah, hang on. Oh, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can play it. i find it. Because what he actually says is, Stop talking about he says, I'm a historian. Here we go. Michael Dell. And here go. There was a billionaire in here. Uh, what's his name? Michael Dell. And uh, he asked the question, like, name me one country where a top marginal tax rate of 70% has actually worked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there. I'm a historian. The United States, that's where it has yeah. actually worked. Yeah. In yes. the 1950s, it during the moon. Republican President Eisenhower, you know, the war veteran, the top marginal tax rate in the U.S. was 91% mm -hmm. for people like Michael Dell. You know, the top estate tax for people like Michael Dell was more than 70%. I mean, this is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid <laughs> philanthropy schemes. Yeah. We can invite there Bono once more. But so, um, it, yeah, it, shade it, on, and I want to say shade on that, Bono, but yep. I, I want to say for that, yeah, he's pointing a finger at the fact when when politicians like Trump come along and say "Make America Great Again," that's the period that they're talking about. Yeah, they're talking about the period where these massively wealthy people paid a huge tax sum. And they paid it, and they went to the moon, and there was the massive up uplift in the quality of life. America was in a golden age. And then they started chipping away at it, and it all went tits up. Yep, Reaganomics. Yep. Um, we're going to wrap up shortly, Chewy, but I want to mention one chat here because we've got a super chat going in for $2. Thanks for your $2. I uh, don't know if we can answer the question particularly. Why do you believe what you believe? I mean, uh, uh, it's a question. And I'm happy to answer it. Thanks for the super yep. chat conspiracy. I that one. Well, you, you go first. Why do you believe what you believe? I was not raised in a wealthy household. I was raised in a state house. Um, I grew up in a time where my dad had been sacked and was out of work for a long time, and my mum worked for a government department. Um, and then by the time I got to school and started studying history, all the great things in history happened through collective action. Um, I believe in helping people wherever you can. And if everybody's pulling in the same direction, it just becomes easier for the individual. So, yes, I'm a big champagne socialist. Um, if you're talking specifically about, I mean, you're basically talking about your politics, why you believe what you believe. I, I kind of thought that, saw that question as a little bit more maybe ethereal about, you know, the life, the universe, and everything. But oh, if we're talking, in that case, if we're talking I'm politically, I'm a Frisbetarian. I believe that when you die, um, your soul goes up onto the roof and nobody can get it down again. <laughs> Um, so politically speaking, I'll be honest, why do I believe what I believe? Really, it's through logic and research. <laughs> Sorry to be boring, but I like I like numbers and I like patterns and I uh, have common sense and I like consistency and authenticity. Mm -hmm. And that's how I base my sort of uh, what I believe. I mean, believe is an interesting word because believe implies uh, blind faith. Um, but um, as we've done this week numerous times, when something is questionable from the left, we ask it. When something is questionable from the right, we ask it. Uh, when something is neutral and we don't know, we ask you. So what do you guys think? Or we put the question out there to come back to next week. And that's really how I form my opinions on anything, whether it's talking politics or talking technology, or whether it's talking whatever. It's logic and research and, um, yeah, common sense is in there as well. That's why I believe, how I kind of get to what I believe. And also the other thing, actually, which I'll mention, because there's people in the chat who, who this would apply to, is um, wise counsel, learning mm -hmm. from other people. You know, there are people in the chat right now that I've learned from, learning from other people and getting input from smarter. I say this all the time, and I say to my other podcast, I love being the dumbest person in the room. It's one of my favorite things, being the dumbest person in the room, because I like to be able to get and when you're the smartest person in the room, you're typically giving. And when you're the dumbest person in the room, you get the, the, the joy of sitting back and getting. And yeah, all of those things together kind of inform my quote unquote belief or my position, whatever you want to say. That's it. Yeah. So there. 
so there is there anything else you want to mention from the chats um welcome to armageddon news um i think you've stumbled into the wrong room but we welcome you nonetheless. <laughs> uh, just referring to the chat i'm not going to put any of the chat up because it is brain worms <laughs> but uh welcome anyway um Yes, this has been a good chat. A another uh, spectacular hour and a half of our traditionally hour-long show because we go on tangents, and I've yeah. been especially ranty tonight. So, um, sorry, ranty McRant a lot. You guys up past your bedtimes? Yeah, no. Hey, um, yeah, we're done. And look, we're not going to be here Monday night because it's a public holiday, and we will be mourning the Queen. The queen. Chewie's a capitalist, so he gets time and a half in Dane Lou. I'll just be mourning the queen. Oh, I, can, I, can, I can do both. Right. Fair enough. I can sell things and mourn on my Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So we won't be here on Monday. And then uh, as a reminder, not that anyone needs this much notice in two weeks from uh, now. So first week of October, uh, we haven't quite decided how it's going to work, but I will not be here. Uh, I will be out of Dunedin and I will be taking a break. We've been doing this show since... 1947 it feels like is that right <laughs> i think since the start of march every single day we started the show at 11 in the morning we then moved it to midday we then you moved it to 10 p.m and it's been on every single day and i'm planning on taking that whole week off which is october 2nd or 3rd through to the 9th ish whatever that is uh there is a chance depending on what chewy and uh georgie want to do if, if anything that i might do a night or two at the start of the week and they might take over the we haven't made these decisions yet but there's also a chance that it might just be best of for the week um which will mostly feature for a little Chewy. bit of column a little bit of column b yeah, yeah 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 so just a heads up for that if if you give a fuck which i'm sure you don't um the other thing to remind you all of is we are looking for your help and you're more than welcome to jump on patreon.com forward slash big hairy news uh, our membership levels go from five dollars a month as a coffee runner uh you can be a patron a super patron a producer a senior producer and an executive producer uh there are benefits with all of those levels including merchandise uh caps and t-shirts down at the producer and senior producer level uh along with the executive producer as well and you know we've had 20 people sign up we've only been doing it for a week and a half um so appreciate that and if you want to get them behind and help support us continue to make independent news as i said there along the bottom and um we would love to have you on board the other way you can support us and get involved is to actually share our shit uh follow us on youtube and on youtube you can get us at uh the channel you're probably actually probably watching probably everyone is anyone not watching us on youtube right now Put a message in the box, but everyone's probably watching us on YouTube. But if you're not, you can go follow us on YouTube. And when I make clips the next day, like I made a clip this morning, I think of the Nanaya Mahuta conversation we had last night. I made a clip on Wednesday night about uh, Dr. Anna Brooks from Tuesday night, on Wednesday morning, I should say. Uh, we then put them up there as well. So you can get the whole show there, you can get clips there, you can interact with us there, and any other content that's made by DOC and Z Studios, like my other podcast, The Department of Conversation, it gets put up there as well. So, yep, subscribe at, uh, we, I, I think I saw today, Chewy, and I actually think it's quite a good number. I think about 30% of the people who watch our videos are subscribed. The other 60 to 70% are not. Um, uh, and, and, and I'll just say that those guys, like, we talk about you. Are assholes. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I think there are some channels where, like, only 4% of the people who watch the videos are the subscribed audience and 96% aren't. So I think perhaps... 30 percent is all right but subscribe and watch us and share our shit and um, if you feel like being involved in patreon happy to have you on board uh first patreon happens on the first of october the first payment that goes out um the first donation that goes out i will be in contact with everyone who is a patron before the first of october and probably in that first weekend of october is when we'll do our first because one of the things you can do i think you need to be a 15 dollar you need to be a 15 dollar or maybe it's a 35 dollar i can't remember uh is a like a, a monthly behind paywall live stream conversation um and so we'll have that probably in the first week of october all right team i think we're done we're done chewy i think we're done chewy yep absolutely thanks guys thanks People for sticking with us to press like more <laughs> oh like yep. I thought it like was it. like, because my, my kids use that word, you know, like, and I was like, people need to press like more, you know, I, I got the in, intonation in there. People need to press like All more. right, boomer. I got the, uh, <laughs> I 
Someone called me that the other day. Oh, I'm like, dude, I, I, I'm okay. Generation uh, X. What, one comment before we go. Oh, I, I, oh. I had a customer come in today oh, and she opened with, oh, you're going to hate me. I've come in with my boomer problems and I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't help it. It just came out. And I says, too many houses, property <laughs> out of control. Um, and I got away with it. She laughed. Still nice. got a job. Anyway. All right, team. We'll see you Tuesday night from 10 p.m. because Monday's a public. Monday is a pubic holiday, uh, celebrating the Queen in our best puby way we can. Other than that, we will uh, catch you from Tuesday. So choose four shows next week, and then I think I'm off for a whole week, um, which sounds we'll weird when happens. you're the only person. You yeah, will see what happens, but that's the plan. Um, <laughs> I want to see what it's like. I'm, I can't remember what Tuesday nights are like. It's a weird yeah. feeling, actually. Um, but other than that, we'll catch you next week. Uh, be safe, everybody, over the long weekend. Enjoy it. Uh, make sure you you put on your best uh, monarchy wave at some stage on Monday. And uh, we'll talk to you Tuesday night from 10 p.m. for another edition of Big Hairy News.